Tonight on the News 4 Rundown, finding forgiveness. A woman ambushed by a 16-year-old boy outside her D.C. home is now meeting face-to-face -face with her attacker. I said yes because it was a way for me to have some closure. In a story you will see only on News 4, the woman tells Mark Seagraves why she forgave the teen, plus her message for him. A battle over benefits. Advocates say a state program that's supposed to help people in the disability community may actually be preventing them from living their best lives. The changes now they're now fighting for plus. This is frustrating because it is being argued when the truth is there should be no statute of limitations. I'm Tracy Wilkins. Coming up on News 4, survivors of alleged abuse at the hands of the Catholic Church were in court today defending the very law that's allowing them to finally seek justice. We'll have the outcome of today's court decision next. You're watching the News 4 Rundown. And thanks for joining us for the rundown, our newscast streaming for you. I'm Jim Adley. And I am Amy Cho. It is Wednesday, March 6th, and we begin with a story you will see only on News 4. It is a lesson in second chances. Yeah, a local woman ambushed by a 16-year-old boy outside her home says she has since met her attacker and forgiven him. Surveillance video caught the attack on Capitol Hill back in 2022. Now the woman tells our Mark Seagraves, why she forgave the teen and what she asked him when they met. This security video shows the 16 year old boy attacking Isabella Harris, hitting her in the head with a brick. The injury so severe, blood stained the sidewalk and Harris was taken to the hospital. She still suffers some hearing loss. Today, 18 months after the attack, Harris notes things are getting better. For the first like six months or so, I was pretty nervous going out and about and about noises at night. The teenager who attacked her was quickly arrested. He admitted guilt in court and entered into an agreement that included a restorative justice program as well as other conditions, rather than being sent to a juvenile detention center. Shortly after that, his social worker contacted Harris, asking if she would agree to meet face to face with her attacker. At first I was like, heck no. But then I said, well, this is an opportunity to um, maybe change this person's life. So I said yes, because it was a way for me to have some closure. Because, you know, when you're a victim of crime, you usually don't get any chance to make something better of it. Usually it's just, you wait for it to be forgotten in your brain. That takes a long time. So this was a good way to cleanse my brain and feel that something slightly positive or neutral came of this event. The meeting included Harris, the young boy, his father, as well as three social workers. He did apologize to me and it was sincere and I definitely appreciated that. And then uh, I, I was allowed to ask questions as well. So I did ask, why did he do this to me? Why did he pick me? And I had con worries or concerns that I didn't want to be a victim again. The teen asked to speak with Harris alone. She agreed. As for what she told him in private. I did forgive him. And what did you tell him? To grow up and be responsible for himself, be responsible for his actions, be a good person, be able to support himself, be proud. Harris feels better about what happened after meeting the teen and his father. We actually all hugged and I hugged this boy and he was really small. He was a young teenage, well, he was a teenager, he was small. But we all hugged and he felt good and I felt good. In the district, Mark Seagraves, News 4. Wow, what an incredible mm -hmm. story there. It really is. Uh, yeah, and Harris tells us she has received three letters from the teen since their meeting, updating her on his progress in vocational school. Now here's a look at some of the other stories we're following for you tonight. The founder of that non-DC nonprofit that serves homeless LGBT youth has been arrested on money laundering and fraud charges. According to the U.S. Attorney's Office, Ruby Corrado allegedly diverted at least $150,000 in emergency relief funds that were supposed to go to her nonprofit Casa Ruby. 
Corrado's accused of moving the money to a private offshore bank account in El Salvador for her personal use. Federal officials say she was arrested yesterday morning at a hotel in Laurel. The rematch between President Joe Biden and former President Donald Trump is all but set. After Trump's dominant showing on Super Tuesday, his last GOP primary opponent, Nikki Haley, announced she was suspending her campaign today. This makes Trump the presumptive nominee and sets up a 2020 rematch with President Biden. New video shows two suspects accused of raping a woman in Hyattsville. Prince George's County Police tell us this happened Monday evening on Adger Road. Now, police are asking anyone with information to give them a call. A third suspect has been arrested in connection with the death of a young girl from D.C. Last year, 10-year-old Ariana Davis was caught in the crossfire on Mother's Day. She was riding in a car with her family when she was hit by a stray bullet. She died three days later. The suspect, Charles Owens, has now been charged with first-degree murder in addition to two other men. The law that allows survivors of childhood sex abuse in Maryland to file civil cases no matter when their abuse occurred withstood its first major legal challenge today. Yeah, we are talking about the Child Victims Act. It passed last year and opened the floodgates for survivors to bring civil claims against those they hold responsible. The act led to a lawsuit against the Archdiocese of Washington, but today's ruling could have widespread implications for survivors suing others, too. News 4 investigative reporter Tracy Wilkins has been tracking this case for us and was in the courtroom today. At the center of today's court case was whether the Child Victims Act passed in 2003 in Maryland was constitutional. Today, the judge ruled that it was. The News for I team was first to report on a civil lawsuit filed against the Archdiocese of Washington under the Maryland Child Victims Act. In it, three plaintiffs described the alleged abuse they endured as children by priests and people employed by the Catholic Church. We previously spoke exclusively with one of the men. We obscured the man's face and altered his voice to help protect his identity. There's no doubt my mind he did it to other boys. Today in Prince George's County Circuit Court, a judge heard the church's motions to dismiss that lawsuit and arguments from attorneys for survivors for why the suit should be allowed to go forward. The archdiocese argued the church and its assets are protected from these kinds of challenges under a statute of limitations stipulated in an older Maryland law. It went on to say the Child's Victims Act passed in 2023 is unconstitutional because it seeks to take away what they called a vested right of protection. The judge ruled against that argument, allowing the case to move forward. Attorney John Shakur represents the plaintiffs in the lawsuit. The judge made a point of saying that the, the intent of the legislature was not to protect people who are sexual abusers, not to protect them. Frustrating, exhausting. I mean, Jean and I have been at it since 95. Teresa Lancaster and Jean Hargadon Weiner have been fighting the Archdiocese of Baltimore for decades. Their allegations of sexual abuse at their high school were featured in the Netflix documentary, The Keepers. The two testified in Annapolis to get the Child Victims Act of 2023 passed, allowing them and other survivors of sexual abuse to sue. As a survivor who started remembering years after the abuse, it is known and I can attest to how long it took for me to be able to talk about it, to bring it to anyone. There should be no statute of limitations for this crime. The attorneys representing the archdiocese declined to comment on losing their first legal challenge to the CVA. Shakur called today a victory. It's a great day for survivors of sexual abuse in Maryland because they've been waiting decades. The attorneys for the survivors are assuming that the church is going to appeal this case and that it will be taken up by the Supreme Court in Maryland. In Upper Marlboro, I'm Tracy Wilkins, News 4 I team. In a statement, the Archdiocese of Washington told News 4 it intends to appeal today's decision, but said regardless of that outcome, it remains committed to its, quote, longstanding efforts to bring healing to survivors through pastoral care and other forms of assistance that are available apart from the legal process. Jim. Many localities have taken on Vision Zero, an ambitious plan to eliminate all severe traffic injuries and deaths. Now, for the first time, one of our local jurisdictions has actually accomplished that. 
Alexandria finished last year without a single traffic fatality. How do they do it? Likely through a number of road design changes, new speed cameras set up near school zones, the narrowing of roads and the lowering of speed limits. While this is an accomplishment and a step in the right direction, there were still more than a dozen serious traffic injuries that left people with critical injuries. Alexandria first announced back in 2017 that they were going to adopt this Vision Zero goal. Amy? Well, advocates say that change is needed for a Maryland program that helps those in the disability community to be more independent. News 4's Dominique Moody reports from Annapolis, where many gathered to talk about frustrations and limitations in the program. Demonstrators gathered in Annapolis in front of the House and Health and Operations Committee to rally for new legislation they say would help people with disabilities in Maryland. House Bill 822 and Senate Bill 790 would provide medical assistance services for employed individuals with disabilities and prevent the state's Department of Health from imposing limitations on disabled workers. The Employed Individuals with Disabilities Program offers Medicaid for Maryland workers with disability. Josh Basil is a quadriplegic with two kids and benefits from the state's Employed Individuals with Disabilities Program. It hurts that I can't love like and be a fa recognized family just like everyone else just because of my disability i have to choose caregiving and that's i choose caregiving because that's survival basil says due to a current provision on income thresholds he has yet to marry his long-term partner because if he did his premium for benefits would increase significantly my premium per month would go from 55 dollars a month to over 500 dollars a month my uh, wage increases my income increases then my premium goes up. I fully support that. But once you bring in a, a spouse's income into it, it, it basically is just a penalty. The legislation would also prevent eligibility to be based on a worker's income or spouse's income being over a certain age and also require disability advocates to meet with a state-based coalition twice a year to discuss changes. Retired school teacher Cynthia Rapp and the sponsor of the bill says the age limits could present challenges for EID program recipients who are 65 and older and want to continue working. A person with a disability is um, told so often and looked upon as uh, not being productive. Support with activities of daily living, and that could be up to 24 hours a day, are able to have those services even though their income level may be over the Medicaid normal limits. Now the Senate's Finance Committee is expected to listen to the Senate bill for the employed individuals with disabilities program next Tuesday at one o'clock. In Annapolis, Dominique Moody, News 4. Still to come tonight on the News 4 Rundown, it's being called the most significant cyber attack on the U.S. healthcare system in American history. Yeah, the attack happened two weeks ago and patients are still being affected. We are working for you with the steps you can take if your prescriptions have been impacted. Welcome back to the News 4 Rundown. Well, it is being called the most significant cyber attack on the U.S. healthcare system in American history. Two weeks ago, hackers attacked Change Healthcare, the country's largest commercial prescription processor. The financial fallout is still being felt by patients and their doctors. Consumer reporter Susan Hogan has been following this attack since it began. She joins us with the latest and explains why Congress is being asked to step in. Yeah, so this chaos all stems from a ransomware attack on Change Healthcare, which processes a large percent of all of the medical claims in the country. It works with thousands of healthcare providers, insurance companies, pharmacies to determine what you, the patient, owes and also giving you prior authorizations for tests. When the company got hacked, it shut down most of its systems that made it harder for hospitals to provide patient care, fill prescriptions, submit insurance claim, and receive payments. As a result, some patients are having to pay the full amount for their medications. So as of this week, there is some progress being made. Change Healthcare says its latest data shows 90% of claims are flowing uninterrupted. It's hoping to see that number increase to 95% next week. 
In terms of prescriptions, ePrescribe is now available for pharmacies to receive electronic payments. At the height of the cyber attack, you may remember that pharmacies weren't even able to process electronic payments, so that's progress. If you cannot get your prescription, there are some options. Ask your doctor for a sample pack of your medication. Ask for the generic form of your medication. It's usually less expensive. If you're paying out of pocket because your insurance wasn't going through, save your receipts so you can file for reimbursement. Now, we also reached out to TRICARE, which tells us its military pharmacies are continuing to process prescriptions manually, so expect delays there. However, in some cases, you will be asked to pay full cost for your prescription, so you will need to file a claim for reimbursement. And one more thing, Change Healthcare still has not released any information on what, if any, patient information was impacted by this hack. We'll, of course, stay on top of this and bring you the latest. Back to you. Thank you, Susan. Now to sports, where the Washington Commanders are making moves in the offseason. Today, they signed a potential weapon for a new quarterback. Team insider J.P. Fenley has details. Commanders news just days ahead of the new league year and free agency opening across the NFL. They've signed veteran tight end Zach Ertz. You might remember Zach Ertz was a three-time Pro Bowler playing with the Philadelphia Eagles, was part of that Eagles Super Bowl winner that upset the Patriots in Minnesota a few years back. Now, Ertz is 33 years old. He's not exactly a young guy, but when he was in Arizona most recently, when Cliff Kingsbury was the head coach out there, they did pretty well. Health has been an issue for Ertz. He's missed a ton of games over the last four seasons. But if the version of Zach Ertz that signs in Washington can refine his role in Cliff Kingsbury's offense, remember Kingsbury is now the offensive coordinator for the commanders, this thing could work. It's a low risk, potentially high reward signing. And I think Washington and Ertz make sense for each other. Covering the commanders, I'm J.P. Finley. We'll soon see. Yes, <laughs> we'll all be uh, keeping our eyes on that. When we come back tonight, a family reunion decades in the making. And a story you'll see only on News 4, how a Northern Virginia man stolen at birth recently reconnected with family he never knew he had. Welcome back to the News 4 Rundown. During the pandemic, a group of women in the D.C. restaurant industry came together to support each other and weather the storm. Yeah, now that group is expanding, joining forces with a sister organization in Los Angeles. Tommy McFly is joined by two of Regarding Her's champions in the scene. During Women's History Month, dozens of leading ladies from D.C.'s food scene are coming together for an annual initiative to promote women in all facets of the industry. Jamie Leeds, chef and restaurateur of Hank's Oyster Bar, and Daniela Senor, founder of Culotta Shop. Join us now. Welcome, ladies. Thanks Thank you. Us. Can you set the scene for me? What are your thoughts just overall of the D.C. dining scene today? D.C. is still a very, very vibrant and exciting scene. You know, we have so many immigrants, so many different types of cuisine, yeah. and we have it at an elevated level here, so that's great to see. And yeah. such an interesting thing, like, it's, a, it's more of a dance now, I think, between restaurants and diners. Yeah. yeah, we're trying to help the guests understand what's going on on the business side. A lot of our guests that are coming in, and I know there's a lot of chatter going around about regarding service charges and uh, rising prices, and we're feeling it too. We want to make sure that we are providing the best experience to our guests, but also survive as a business. People will say, you don't open till 5 o'clock. Why are you guys coming in at 7 a.m.? I'm like, well, it takes a lot. <laughs> this is why. So, Look this at this is, stuff. This doesn't just happen It doesn't by magic, just happen. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It takes a lot to, to make get your food on the plate. And all throughout March, regarding her, the organization is hosting a food festival. Daniela, you are using your spot to give a spotlight to startups. To me, giving uh, a spot and highlighting other women is honestly what keeps me going. You know, that's why I want to keep growing and keep expanding. The majority of our managers are women. I want women in leadership. Being honest, like when I started, it felt like a very catty environment to me. It's like because there was one seat for one woman at the table and I didn't understand that I'm like how is that possible I come from the Dominican Republic which people say it's kind of like a macho country but it's actually pretty much run by women so I'm like, <laughs> I, don't, yeah. I'm like I don't understand this like why is there not more room more space more collaboration so I love that regarding her is giving uh, as an organization that opportunity to bring us together they say it's a man's world out there well how about we make it a women's world 
What was that like? Hanks is going to be 20 this yep, next year? Yeah, we're going to be 20 in 20 next year in 2025. That's awesome. How is the landscape different? Oh, my gosh. For a woman well, starting out today, well, is yeah. it any better? Well, it is better, but it's not as good as it should be, given how many years it's been. I mean, when I came up in the 80s, um, you know, I was the only line cook in the kitchen. I was the only one, you know, in the trenches, the only woman. More women in more places of leadership. How is that going to improve the dining scene for D.C.? Well, I would say, from my point of view, like, when you remember, like, your family, who's usually doing the cooking? But in a professional setting, somehow that got shifted. Uh, women bring with them a lot of culture, a lot of family, a lot of support for their neighborhoods, mm -hmm. a, a lot of a sense of community and responsibility. You ask most of us how you started cooking, it was about bringing people together. That's really what it's about, and I think bringing people together ultimately will change the world. I think women have just a little bit of a different take on, you know, more of a caretaking mentality. What do you hope diners are looking for when they're scrolling the reservation app besides just, is it available? I hope they would see that it's a woman-owned restaurant. I hope that they would look for that. I hope that they would, you know, and want to support that. We want to make sure that respect is mutual and that we're supporting each other. Daniela mm -hmm. Senor from Culotta Shop. I've been sniffing this coffee. It smells so good. Jamie Leeds from Hank's Oyster Bar. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a number on all this food. So I'm going to send it back <laughs> to you and make sure you check out all of the regarding her Women's Food Festival all throughout the month. Back to you. Tommy gets all the fun props. <laughs> I know. I'm so Down jealous. <laughs> but Good now we know that. there's food in the break room. So exactly. that's why I'm headed right after right this. Leftover. <laughs> Thank you, Tommy. <laughs> well, Howard University students are giving up their traditional spring break for community service and engagement for what they call an alternative spring break or ASB. Yeah, they left Saturday for the week-long experience. This year's theme, a legacy of pain at Ford, 30 years of service. Their work will be in 20 cities all over the country struggling with food insecurity, crime, and truancy in schools. Senior uh, Tira Lacey is the co-executive student director. She's working with groups in the district. Mentoring, tutoring, we're going to be working in some food pantries, we're going to be working in some gardens, just ensuring that not only are the children being poured into mentally and within knowledge, but just ensuring that they have a place where they can feel comfortable and safe and just, you know, at home, like we do when we live here for four years. Tyra graduates, by the way, in May. She's been accepted into medical school. Good for her and all of them. What a great program. Yeah, absolutely. That's very kind of them to, to be donating their time like that. It really is. Finally tonight, a Northern Virginia man and his sister who were ripped away from mom after they were born in Chile have just met her decades later. Yeah, the brother and sister were adopted by a family here in the U.S. The family was told their mom had given them up for adoption because she was poor, but their biological mom was told her children had died at birth. It was part of a larger adoption scheme affecting thousands of children in Chile. News Force Darcy Spencer has more on the emotional reunion in a story you'll see only on News 4. This is the moment Sean Hours waited 40 years for, embracing his biological mom. But he had to travel 5,000 miles from D.C. to Chile to make it happen. Everything just blurred away, and it was just, I was just stuck in the moment, and it was just such a surreal moment. I was so happy. Within the last year, Hours and his sister learned they were kidnapped at birth from their biological mom, Sarah. She believed all these years her children had died. Their adoptive parents were told their mom was poor and willingly gave them up for a better life. It's terrible what they did to her, and this, um, from what she said, she never even got to hear me cry. Um, so <laughs> that that's hard. They were able to find Sarah through a nonprofit called Connecting Roots, which has been helping children snatched away from their moms and sold into adoption find their families. Ours and his sister were happy to learn their mom was alive and wanted to be a part of their lives. It makes you think like how my life could have been down there opposed to up here, but I'm very fortunate up here. We had such a great family up here to take care of us. On the trip to Santiago, they met family members, took day trips, and had plenty of food. Hours brought back memories, mementos, and some gifts from the mom he never knew. She gave me this um, 
necklace of Jesus saying he will always be with me and always keep me safe. They also learned more about how as many as 20,000 children were stolen in the 70s and 80s during the Pinochet regime. Hours became emotional at a museum that displayed photos of people taken during the dictatorship who are still missing. Especially when we saw a lot of the drawings that kids drew about their families being taken away or family members dragged off for them never to be seen again. One of the hardest parts of the trip was saying goodbye, but they parted with a promise. It was the first time they'd seen each other, but it would not be the last. Darcy Spencer, News 4. Hmm. Wow, what an incredible story. It really is an amazing reunion. Yeah, and Hours says he is working on his Spanish and his biological mom is working on her English so they can communicate better. I love it. What a bond they've got forever now. Absolutely. He says he's hoping to return next year and introduce his kids to the grandma they never do. We're very happy for them. Mm -hmm. And that'll do it for the News 4 Rundown. Thank you for joining us. I am Amy Cho. I'm Jim Hanley. We'll see you back here tomorrow.